uh, Vietnam vet, uh, and uh, and also I want to acknowledge all the other veterans in the in the in the in the in the, in the room here, uh, Korean War vets, Marviks, uh, and and the rest of us Vietnam vets, and all the branches of the service represented here. Also, raise your hand, all of us veterans that are in the room. My goodness, just a couple. <laughs> okay, wow. thank you. Thank all of us for our service. Thank you. And Jack, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dennis in the brochure. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I have taken over 200 slides. Is, is this when I was in Vietnam, I was fortunate that uh, before I left, I had a nice camera, and it was kind of a point and shoot, but it did a fabulous job, as you will see. And I have narrowed these down to approximately, um, you know, not quite. Um, not no, but well, it doesn't actually give the exact. I think we're down to about 60 some slides that I have uh, gone through the 200 that I had, or over 200. But anyway, this first slide here is me at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, this was uh, the ending of my basic training. It's either one or the other. And, uh, it's either one or the other. Jack, real quick, go ahead and turn off that oh, yeah. switch. Okay. And that was the concrete barracks that uh, we had. We didn't have the old World War II uh, wood structures at that time. Uh, and I had the, uh, was very fortunate last year. I happened to be headed down to Nashville and uh, I was driving and I knew I was extremely close to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I hadn't been there in 47 years. And um, I said to my wife, I said, I think I'm going to take a detour. And I went over to the guard gate and said that uh, I was here 40 some odd years ago, and I'd like to go into the base. And believe it or not, I got on. <laughs> I found the barracks, some of them. Um, they were no, no longer used as barracks. They were, the government was spending millions of dollars to renovate these things into offices. So I was fortunate just to be able to walk into the old barracks and re remember what took place 47 years ago. So after that, uh, I, not, no, not yet. Um, after this, I did not take a camera down to, um, I was a, after basic training, I took advanced infantry training uh, at Fort Polk, Louisiana. So right after graduation, uh, they put us on buses and sent us all the way down to Louisiana. Um, of course, it was getting cold in, uh, in Kentucky around the end of, uh, mid part of uh, September of uh, 1969. And when I got down to Louisiana, it was warm again. So that felt really good. Um, being down there, we were in the old World War II structured wood barracks. <coughs> and from there, um, a lot of memories. <laughs> but um, after finishing the uh, basic or advanced training, I had a 21 day leave and got my orders for Vietnam, which everybody knew when you were in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and you're pretty much bound for Vietnam at that point. Um, so, um, leaving um, after the 21 days, uh, got on an airplane, flew out to Seattle, Washington, and uh, picked up a, um, I was fortunate enough that I didn't hang around the uh, Fort Lewis, Washington area. They put us on a plane within, I think it was um, 36, 48 hours. And I was on my way to Vietnam. Um, the, first, the first stop we had for refueling, these were commercial uh, aviation that were uh, chartered by the military. 
So they had 200 seats on board, so every aircraft, it was a, either a Boeing 707 or a DC-8 that held 200 people. And they flew us and we, <coughs> my first stop was in Hawaii. <coughs> so I actually got out, well everybody had to, you know, get off the plane when they refueled it back in those days. And so I actually walked outside, so my feet actually touched Hawaiian soil. <laughs> So I could say I was at least in Hawaii. Uh, from there we flew on to Guam and refueled there and then the next stop then was on to Vietnam. Um, landed at Cameron Bay on around the 8th of December 1969. And at that particular point, um, myself and I don't know, a couple dozen of us basically were pulled out because we were infantry trained and we got to pull guard duty around Cameron Bay at night. So we thought it was a pretty cake job. We wanted to do this permanently for our entire time there, but that didn't happen. Um, we were always the first in chow because then we had to prepare for guard duty. So one night, after about three weeks, close to around three weeks, we weren't the first in line for chow. So we knew we were being reassigned. So the next day they put us on an airplane, C-130, and flew us up to Pleiku. It was a small uh, army base up there, and from there we, uh, they took us out, they issued us our M-16 rifles. We zeroed them in in a, in a shooting range that they had um, set up. So from that point on, um, after that, I spent Christmas at the base camp, and um, that was the strangest part of being someplace in a foreign country and a military base on Christmas Day. And um, then after that, within a day or so, they shipped us up to uh, or out to the field. They put us on a, um, I think, a little small truck or whatever it was, and and pull us out to. Um, I was basically set up to go to the uh, A Troop, the 1st Squadron of the 10th Cavalry that was attached to the 4th Infantry Division. And this was up in the Play Coup area of the map. You can <coughs> change pictures, yeah. And after we were in the field, oh, let's see, we basically wasn't exactly sure what our mission was because I was so new in country. My fatigues were nice and new, green, you can always tell who was new and who wasn't. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I haven't decorated my helmet cover yet, but uh, everybody had started and you basically decided, you know, you, how many days you had still left in country. And that was how you kept track as to how long it was. We were basically going to be there. Um, this photograph here was taken after I had been. We had uh, missions, basically, uh, one or two missions that we had hauled, which were CIDGs. Basically, they were mountain yard. Uh, the type of uh, people that they had in Vietnam were either they were Vietnam <coughs> Vietnamese citizens or they were um, mountain yard. Um, and I'll show you some differences in where they lived. Uh, but we hauled uh, the uh, mountain yard troops at that time. They were called Arvins, if I'm not mistaken. And we had packed them on the tops of the armored personnel carriers and then carried them into Cambodia, which President Nixon said we weren't in Cambodia, but we were. <laughs> so um, after we were. This was around either the very end of January of 1970 or the first part of February. They take us in, and this was a stand down, what they take you. They go out of the base, bring you into the base camp, and then you do complete maintenance on your vehicle because we were getting ready to travel about a 50 mile trip. And you didn't want to be broken down on a convoy. So. All of this, basically, we would change the tracks if the tracks needed to be completely changed or a portion of them. So that means these vehicles were completely tore down. They were, you know, uh, 
they were pretty much having to be moved with by other pieces of equipment so you could uh, change the tracks they do engine work on them you know change the oils they had all kinds of fluid and the, the transmissions the, the gear drives on the side for each of the track to make it run um, the engine that they were diesel engines everything between the tanks this is our second platoon and one of the platoons was consisted of seven armor personnel carriers which everybody refers to them as APCs and the others are M48 tanks which had a, a 50 caliber machine gun on the top and a, they were a 90 millimeter gun as the tanks weapon and um, so this was a stand down and they were we were repairing everything getting ready to go over to they were moving us from plate cool over to a town called on k which was on highway 34 or highway 19 i forget which was the numbers at the time uh, but anyway this is the um, i think we're getting ready uh, so there's 10 vehicles in each platoon and we had three platoons so there's 30 vehicles just in our our, our company or our squadron <clears throat> so um go to the next picture this is what the roads look like they were asphalt but as you can see there's their dirt on the sides um at this particular point um we ran into a small little village but you can see This is what Agent Orange did. It kept the foliage from growing up near the road, which prevented the Viet Cong basically from pulling an ambush on the convoys. And the convoys that normally traveled through there was resupplying jet fuel, diesel fuel, uh, food, whatever that the military needed to move on the roads that they couldn't or they didn't transport into the uh, the major air bases or the you know, landing zones uh, at the major base camps uh, throughout Vietnam and so they relied heavily on convoys and uh, and air travel uh, the C-130s especially uh, they were they were a workhorse over in Vietnam um, so um, I happened to be brought, I was just a, an extra riding on this armored personnel carrier this day because I'm fresh in country, probably not more than you know, two months. And uh, we ran into these small little villages. Go ahead, next slide. <coughs> these, this is a mountain yard village, as you can see, because their, their uh, housing or whatever is all on stilts. They were all raised up. And to me, that was a good thing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Now, this would be a regular Vietnamese. The, the, uh, the mountain yard basically was a lower class. I think there was about two classes in Vietnam that I can remember. Uh, the, the, um, the mountain yard was the lower of the class, and of course, the Vietnamese basically lived in you know thatched houses like this. I've seen some other ones, um, but anyway, they had their vegetable gardens and whatever that they grew, and of course there was banana trees and whatever all around, I mean everywhere. So go to the next slide, and this is just some of the, a fraction of the rice patties <coughs> that uh, we came in contact with at times. Um, it's it's something that uh, my wife complains about that I don't eat rice and I told her I said I've seen too many rice patties to eat rice and uh, so okay the next slide this is a, a little bit further down the road remember I'm trying to shoot with a point-and-shoot camera and as we're moving down the road in an armored personnel carrier that just doesn't ride like a car so it uh, some of the pictures you know but these are 48 year old photographs as well so um, 
I had to do some work on these to, you know, take them in, scan them through my projector, and then from there I went into Photoshop and enhanced the or fixed the color to what I can remember from 48 years ago. So anyway, this is some of the kids that were alongside the road at the time. We go to the next photograph. This was one of the other ways that they transported, uh, especially diesel or jet fuel, is they had a pump station. They had a, a pipeline actually running through Vietnam in this particular section. And that was one of our duties, um, was to guard that pump station because of pumping the with a fuel or jet fuel, whatever, through the lines. So we would protect this during the day and at night. And uh, so that was the, the, the pump station. That uh, thing back here, right here, that was like a water tower. And they would take, I don't know how many of you have been in the Army, but they would have these big kerosene kind of heaters that they could stick down in the water. And then basically when we were on bivouac and whatnot, that's how you washed your canteen stuff or whatever they, your eating utensils with. Well, they got smart enough to dump some of those kerosene heaters in that water tank because you didn't get a bath, you didn't get a shower. You went weeks maybe or days until they decided that they could take and fix up a shower with hot water. So that's how we got our showers at times. Sometimes before we left Lake Coo, we actually would take, go over to the streams take off all of our clothes and jump into the streams with the, with the bar of soap. And that was, and these were on dirt roads, so by the time then you drove back up to where the camp was, yeah, LG, you're all dirty again. you had to protect yourself with a, you know, your handkerchief or whatever that you had to protect so that the dust then, because the armored personnel carriers, the LZs inside there, I'll show you some pictures of what happens during the monsoon season in this place. It, uh, but when it wasn't monsoons and the tracks rode through there and the tanks and everything, it was like it was like uh, a powder, um, just like uh, you know flour. It was that consistency because of the, the dryness and the heat then in Vietnam for that time frame. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is one of the bridges, basically, that the um, Corps of Engineers basically constructed, but they had a bypass. I guess they were still working on the approaches of it. This was a temporary thing at the time, but this is like what some of the landscape was. So this isn't as Agent Orange as some of the other areas were. So it varied from, from area to area that which we uh, handled. Um, okay, now, the next slide is going to be a picture of, go ahead, that's that same road that you saw a little bit, you know, just in the previous slide, but this is the kind of area that the Corps of Engineers would build these bunkers so that people could, you know, be in those bunkers. Well, I, we didn't go in the bunkers. When the Corps of Engineers built bunkers, brand new ones, the rats took over. <laughs> they used the bunkers as homes. When I realized that they were, they said, no, we're not, I'm not sleeping in there. Um, there was another story about a rat. So, um, anyway, next slide. It's a laundry day as well. Um, but this is another bridge. So this is what we would protect day and night, the bridges. Um, the Corps of Engineers would build towers, and I spent a day or so in some of those towers from time to time on that particular bridge. And it was keeping the Viet Cong from blowing those bridges up. So that was the main goal. As you can see then, the Agent Orange was different here than you know the effects of it. Um, so let's go to the next slide. This was one of the treacherous 
I've told people that I used to drop we used to go through that. This is called the Ming Yang Pass. And when you get up to the top, it's like cliffs coming down to where the road goes through. And there's a mountain range in Vietnam. And the thing here was is that you could be ambushed really easy. But the Agent Orange, they sprayed constantly up in that area before I even got there. Um, but um, there was a, um, at the top of where we went to, next slide, this is at the top of the Meng Yang Pass, and down in this area, uh, somewhere right around that white area there, was uh, called LZ Action. Those are the LZ standard for landing zone. And that's where helicopters would come in. The, uh, the top military, I don't know if I've seen a general out there, but at least the uh, majors and colonels and whatnot would come out to the base to check it. Uh, that was also an artillery, uh, a big artillery um, base out there as well. Uh, we guarded that at night as well, but this is looking at the top, from the top of the pass where the road goes through, uh, down into that valley down there. Now, if you can continue to go up, and this, we went up one time, there was a, a communication relay station at the top of Mang Yang Pass. And at that particular point, we went up there to check because some of the, uh, um, some Vietnamese in, in their military were guarding that thing all by themselves. When I got to the top of that, I was shocked. I literally, and I don't know why I didn't pull out my camera. Maybe it wasn't with me, it's on some other vehicle at the time. But I was shocked because up there in the top of Meng Yang Pass, up by this uh, communications relay station, was hundreds and hundreds of French graves for when the French was in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And they had buried hundreds of them up there. And they were all in marked. It was just a, a, a shocking thing to realize that, you know, that people were left. They didn't, you know, they weren't taken home the way that Americans, you know, would normally, the GIs were all taken back and shipped home. But the French literally had buried their, their dead there. And it was really something to see. Um, okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is, again, typical surroundings. The, it impressed me the fact that Vietnam was, a, you know, a very gorgeous terrain and, and the landscaping and, and the greenery in areas such as this was just fabulous. But, you know, everything had to be protected from convoys uh, so that, you know, it, it changed. But yet, it was, it was interesting because I'd never been to a, you know, born and raised in Ohio, you know, you didn't get to see anything like this around unless you went down into Kentucky and Tennessee to see the mountains down in that area. Okay, then the next photograph. This is going through what I considered the downtown area of On K, which is, of course, this was in uh, 1970. So I imagine um, yeah, I have done historic district. some yeah. Google Maps or view, uh, uh, Google Street View, not Street View. They don't have Street Views, but the uh, the satellite views of Vietnam in the past few years, and. This does not look anything like it did in 1970. Um, I think the entire country, I would not recognize any place that I was at in Vietnam today, if I would go. Okay, uh, the other thing as we would do, as you saw in the previous slide, we, each of the platoons were, were assigned an area from time to time, and we did switch occasionally from one area to the other. Uh, some of us sometimes were on the east side of Mangang Pass, and some were on the west side of Mangang Pass. 
And so there was this road security for that whole time. Um, we would also do what they called a, a mine sweep every single morning. We would open the road by around 8 o'clock, and at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, all convoys were done. And of course, if the Vietnamese wanted to take their buses and whatnot, they were on their own. We only pulled security between 8 and 5. So before we would open the road in the morning, we would do a mine sweep. That means then one of the, the, the right-hand side of an armored personnel carrier would be on one side and the track would be in on the dirt side. Then the tank would be on the other side and they would go down the road trying to explode any landmines that could have been planted. Now it's very unusual, the next slide, I was walking along one morning doing our particular <coughs> walk. There was somebody on each side of the road looking at the side and besides the, the armored personnel carrier and the tank riding with their tracks in the dirt. I happened to notice one morning a piece of green bamboo in the ground. Now this has been pulled back a little <coughs> bit from the dirt. We took our hands and just moved the dirt back to make sure and sure. But I noticed that green bamboo doesn't grow in the ground parallel. So that set me off and I stopped everybody and said, hey, come here. And they took some of the people came down. One of the tank guys came down and looked at it and said, yep, that's a mine. So I was the only one in our platoon to ever find a mine on the side of the road because I happened to spot a piece of green bamboo. If they would have covered that with a little bit more dirt, we would have driven over it, and chances are it might have exploded on a, on a tank or an armored personnel carrier. The next picture, this is what was in that hole. That's a basket mine. They literally weave baskets, and then they put explosives into one of our unused or used sandbags. So they would pack their dynamite or whatever that they had for explosive inside that basket inside there and put it in the ground. We stopped everything from any opening the road then. When we saw that and we called the, um, I don't know what the <coughs> um, army engineers came out and they pulled this mine out. They, dis they disarmed it first and then they pulled it. They, uh, so they took it from there and we continued on our day. Now, I mentioned earlier about that LZ Blackhawk, that pump station. Um, when it came to monsoon season, that was, that was kind of the worst <coughs> part of the entire tour. Because when you were in the field, the only cover you had was the armored personnel carrier. <coughs> and some of the streams we would go through would barely come up to the track itself, you know, barely come up. All right, next slide. This is some of the, this is not exactly a clear picture, but remember, this is raining, in, and I'm, we just came through this, and the armored personnel carriers were almost going to start to float at that time, but they, these wouldn't float. They were loaded with too much ammo and everything else. I'll show you a little bit more. Okay. Um, anyway, this stream we had crossed previously, and there might have been that much water. When monsoons come, there were, we had to drive through all probably about five or six feet of water. So it, it came up fairly high, and if, the, and if the driver got going a little too fast entering it, he got himself a bath because it came up over the front of the armored personnel carrier and come right into where he was sitting because he was sitting down inside the armored personnel carrier where everybody else was up on top. So he got a bath if he went too fast. So next slide. This is that LZ action that I took, or uh, Blackhawk that I told you about. This was the pump station. And they had to actually take a bulldozer and remove some of the mud because it was so thick it's just the reverse opposite of taking that flour type powder dirt and when you added water to it, it just made a complete mess. We were scraping the bottoms of our armor personnel carriers going through there. 
and occasionally sometimes they actually got stuck. So they had to get pulled out. So monsoons was just not uh, the friendly part for a, an armored vehicle. Okay, next slide. This was Camp Radcliffe. This is um, this was where we moved from Pleiku to Camp Radcliffe. This is kind of their perimeter. Uh, once in a while, I'd be pulling, um, especially when I went to go on R and R. Um, we would have to actually come in to the base camp, and then we would be assigned to go to one of those towers and spend the night. Well, actually, it was either one or two hour shifts to, uh, to do guard duty. They did have lights on it that shined out so that if you could see them coming. And so that was... Um, sometimes the lights helped, sometimes they didn't. So it varied. Um, okay, next slide. Now we're at Camp Radcliffe, and uh, periodically we go back in. This is another stand down for the first platoon that I was in, and we were, you know, going through the maintenance of it. Um, as you can see here on the front of the armored personnel carriers, these type these are chain link fences, and what they were just they were rolled up, and when we would get to a a, a point. On the, uh, and we'll get to a picture of that later on. When we get to a, a point where we would go up off of the main road and sit during the day to protect the convoys, we would put the chain link fences up, we'd pound poles in the ground, and then we'd put the chain link fence in front of the armored personnel carrier. The purpose for this was is that the Viet Cong went to try to shoot a B 40 rocket at us it would hit the chain link fence. That was what it was designed to do, to take and take the rocket, and it would explode the rocket before it hit the armored personnel carrier. So protecting that, so it was the chain link fences that we put up in front. Now that was only on a frontal attack, but if they hit us from the sides, that was something different. Um, the main gun in our armored personnel carrier is, was a 50 caliber machine gun. I don't know if anybody here, well, there's been a number of veterans, I'm sure. A 50 caliber machine gun shell is that long. And it can shoot over five miles, and it is armored piercing to another armored personnel carrier. So the specifications will come up on a different slide. It's in your handout. And that's an inch and a half to an inch and a quarter sheet of an aluminum alloy and a 50 caliber uh, bullet will go through an armored personnel carrier. That's how big. This thing is just absolutely, the shell is just huge. And then on each of the sides was an M60 machine gun, which was a 308 Winchester um, bullet that was linked through clips, and those could shoot roughly around 600 rounds a minute. And uh, so we had two of those. Let's see, we're coming to, yeah. Um, so this was in Camp Radcliffe, and so we're just in here again for doing maintenance, so that we don't have to do maintenance in the field. We do check the oils and stuff in the fields, but not the major track changes and stuff out there. Okay, the next slide. This is the inside of an armored <coughs> personnel carrier. And our basic load of ammunition, which is all this, all of it, we had 5,000 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition, and we had over 6,400 rounds that was just down in here of the for the two M60 machine guns. Well, we just didn't rely on the 6,400. <laughs> we ended up getting a couple mini cans. Um, what a mini can 
That's what they called a Gatling gun that was on some of the uh, Cobra gunships. And also, I've got another photograph here of uh, one of the helicopters. Believe it or not, they made us have gas masks in Vietnam, just in case. So, okay. when I arrived, we hung it on the side, and that's where it stayed. Nobody ever took out their gas masks to even attempt to even figure it out. With the M60 machine guns on top of the armor personnel carrier, we hung our M16s on the inside. So we barely, the only way that those were to come out is basically if we were to take, they took us off. There was usually four to five people on an armor personnel carrier if we had five or six. At night, sometimes they would take one guy from five different armor personnel carriers and they would send them out what was called a dismounted ambush looking for the, the Vietnamese uh, to uh, try to engage into a um, you know a battle right? but uh, we were just basically out there to see what activity was going on if we could find any of the Viet Cong um, so that was the only time we really used the M16s and also with that five-man squad there was one six M60 machine gun with that so not only was I carrying my ammo for my M16 I was also carrying at least 200 rounds of the M60 machine gun ammunition as well each guy so we basically had over a thousand rounds of ammunition just for the M60 machine gun. Yeah. How heavy was that? We didn't carry it very far, but nevertheless, we didn't care how heavy it was because the fact that we didn't want to ever run out of ammunition. The same thing. That was a 94-gallon gas or a diesel tank on these armor personnel carriers, and. If you were the driver and responsible for that, and you let your armor personnel carrier run out of diesel fuel, you would get an Article 15. Yes, it was very serious to run out of diesel fuel. So if the diesel truck came by when we were in the LZs, it didn't matter if I took a gallon or a drop, or five gallons, I would take whatever the truck came by, I'd fill that thing up. No chance of running out of diesel fuel. We didn't want to be stranded. Okay, next slide. Here again. On that, that, that pump station that I mentioned to you, one night I decided to sleep on an army cot out underneath the stars. Not in the bunkers, not inside here. One night, I woke up. I was in a sleeping bag, sitting, sleeping in a, you're fully clothed, M16 is right beside you. The only thing I had off was my boots. And all of a sudden, I woke up and I felt something crawling at my feet. <laughs> and I realized what it was. It was a rat. And it was crawling up on the outside of my sleeping bag. So I felt this, and when I felt the rat get to around where my hip was, the zipper was undone, so I could get out of this thing, I mean, in case we had any activity with the Viet Cong. So I wrapped my hand around the edge of the top part of the sleeping bag, and I flipped it up extremely fast, and he went flying, <laughs> or she. I don't know which one it was, I didn't care. It did. It did. And all I heard was a thunk way off way. So that was the last night I slept out in the under the stars. And from here on out, I slept on 11,000 rounds of ammunition. I crossed more than I did sleeping out or a rat to get to you. So I and we did not have any problems with rats inside the armor personnel believe me. So that's where I learned to sleep every single night, and it was just a very narrow thing, but I didn't care. 
<laughs> so, but that's what the inside looks like. That's the driver's compartment there. <clears throat> so he actually sat down inside that chair with his head sticking out of a hole. Okay, next slide. This is the inside. This is the driver's compartment. And this is why I wanted the stick. This thing here was the lever to pull to the right, or pull back, and you would turn to the right. This lever here, you pull this back, and it would turn you to the left. So you just left them go if you wanted to go straight. And um, one of the experiences that if you wanted to do a 180 degree turn in the middle of the road, you pulled one of these two levers. These were the water uh, levers for steering when you floated these things. We never floated them in Vietnam. Back when I was finishing my six months, last six months at, at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, we actually floated an 11 ton vehicle and they float. We backed them in very carefully. We made sure that the, the back ramp, the door, and everything was sealed. We were, we were hooked with a safety line directly to another vehicle. And of course, I, I backed the thing in. I actually was on the armored personnel carrier as it floated. If we backed it in slowly, if we could see the thing, we pulled it back out. We put some kind of a, a, a little rope or something behind it because they had rubber seals all around the doors and the main ramp area. And so if you wanted to be out there and you were floating, you had to use the other levers on the outside. There's a lever over here that raised and lowered <coughs> the, uh, the back ramp. And this was the uh, safety latch system that actually latched it because it was a hydraulic ramp. Um, our, of course, this was our radio that went up to the track commander. We had a fire extinguisher in case this. This was our main panel for gave the RPMs. It was a, a four-speed uh, automatic transmission, the shifter lever here. The main uh, power supply here, you pushed a button, I think over here or here, and that started it up. To shut the diesel off, you pulled the fuel shut off and that you starved the engine for fuel and it died. So that's how you shut them down. Um, so it wasn't hard to learn if you didn't want to walk. <laughs> so, okay, next slide. This is the information on it. It tells you the weight. Um, it tells you also the horsepower. It was a diesel engine. Uh, it was built by Detroit Diesel, and um, the transmissions, I'd say, were extremely bulletproof. We drove those things up the hill that you probably would have to crawl on your hands and feet, or hands and knees, to get up these hills. And these armored personnel carriers and tanks were able to really go up these hills that were unbelievable. But you didn't want to get them sideways because you didn't want them to start rolling. <laughs> so, next slide. This was our lieutenant when I was first got in country. And that's a tank, one of our... We didn't always have three tanks in a platoon because they would hit a mine. <laughs> and so this was one. And of course, he's got a... a they got two different machine guns. They got one that's in the turret, and then they got the one on the top, that the, up near where the guy is, plus then the 90 millimeter gun. All right, next slide. This was how you kept your, your mail and everything, um, my envelopes, um, everything, my writing material, my ink pen or whatever that I wrote with at the time. Um, I kept a small Bible in there. Um, and this was that you used. It was a 50. It was a, a 50 caliber machine gun uh, can, the ammo can, emptied ammo can, because it was sealed. It was watertight, so that's how you kept your material. I kept my camera sometimes in there, and uh, so that's and the strangest thing. If you ever received a letter from somebody in Vietnam, 
All we had to do where the stamp went, we wrote the word free, and our mail was sent. Uh, next slide. This is coming up the hill that I was talking about earlier. Down in the valley floor is where we started, and so you can see the height and where we're at from the valley floor. And we made this trip up to this particular area several times. Um, sometimes the, um, the commanding generals or whatever it is wanted us to go off-road a little bit more, and so they would take some of us, at least a tank and two armored personnel carriers, and, and I mean, that was a heck of a climb to get up there at that time. Okay, next slide. <laughs> This is me sitting on guard. We had a, a particular sunshade to protect us. That's the 50 caliber machine gun sitting there. And there's a can of 200 rounds of ammunition sitting right there. Or that might have been 100 on that for those, because they were big shells. Um, now, I wasn't really fully in uniform there. Because we were supposed to sit on guard with a flight jacket on. And I'll show you what that picture looks like coming up. That'll be in a little bit. But anyway, if, if the helicopters flew over, we grabbed our flight jackets and threw it on real quick. Next. That is a M60 machine gun. Shoots 600 rounds a minute. And that little tray down here, that holds 200 rounds of ammunition. I've got another, I don't know, 100 here, and sometimes when we had, uh, we had mini cans that we got from the helicopters guys, um, or from the ammo uh, dump, uh, we would get, uh, these mini cans would hold 2,000 rounds of ammunition. So besides the 6,000, we had another 2,000 on each side, so there's 4,000. We had... We didn't want to run out of ammunition. Okay, next. This is um, me sitting there with the, uh, sitting on top. This was normally open. This is closed right now. Um, this was the hatch, the big hatch that allowed us to get into the ammo. And I'm not sure why, unless the only reason we closed those, and they didn't want us to, but we did anyway, that was the hatch that we closed during monsoons to keep the armored personnel carrier inside where I slept uh, dry. Okay, next slide. This is typically the armored personnel carrier. That was the, we used a poncho liner along with the radio antenna on the armored personnel carrier to keep it up. We put holes in the front and um, why the uh, why the uh, chain link fence is on here because there must have been one that was already on this particular thing and it stayed there. But, um, and of course, we had one guy, I mean, literally, this was, we spent eight hours there from eight to five every day on, you know, we did stay to, we didn't go to the same place sometimes day after day, but there was some armor personnel carriers sitting there <coughs> usually every single day on these particular, what they called strong points. But that was our typical day. We were there one or two hours at a time, somebody else took over, and we'd go lay down, take a nap, do whatever. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, one time I was back at Camp Radcliffe, and they were brought some of us in, and they got word that there was some um, uh, armored personnel carriers to be picked up. We were short some for our particular uh, squadron probably, so they got a couple of us to volunteer to go over to Quignon to drive some armored personnel carriers back. So we grabbed our M16s and about, I don't know how many rounds or magazines of ammo we had. We grabbed that and flight jackets and we jumped into this helicopter at Camp Radcliffe and took us over to On K. That was a major, major import um, for our supplies to come into uh, that part of Vietnam, which was right on the coast. And when we got there, um, 
there weren't any armored personnel carriers for us to drive back. So we had a free day or so, so we swam in the South China Sea. That was very interesting to be able to say that you went swimming in Vietnam in the South China Sea. To me, that, that was just something that was... But the problem was is getting to the water from the beach. The sand was so hot, it would burn your feet. And so you had to literally run so far till you could stand it, and then you had to work your feet down into the sand. And then you had to get up, take off, and run again to get as far until you hit the water. The water was probably, uh, I don't know, probably in the temperature of the water was probably 90 degrees or more. So, yeah. <coughs> no, because that sunshade we had kept that very well cool. Besides, it had to heat, you know, an inch and a half to inch and a quarter of uh, aluminum alloy. But they cooled down at night. There's another small story I'll tell you in a second. Well, while I'm, um, anyway, we'll continue here uh, with the helicopter ride. The only time I actually rode in a helicopter in Vietnam. And the strangest thing is that they told us to take our steel helmets off and sit on them. Mm -hmm. And I never did figure out why, but this was in case somebody was shooting from down below up to kill or shoot down the helicopter, it would not hit you in the butt. It would, you would be sitting on your steel helmet, but that wasn't going to stop a bullet after you came through. I didn't think so anyway, but I thought it was a little strange, but I went ahead and did it and followed suit. But then after we got up, because when the helicopter took off from Camp Radcliffe, it went straight up and up and up. And I thought, geez, when are we going to stop? And it kept going up. And then once we got up high enough, he started it forward in the forward position. Go ahead. Next slide. And this is what was the strangest thing, because I had never seen this part of Vietnam until I got into the helicopter and was heading over towards Quinh Nhan. And to see all the rice paddies and everything else, the, the houses and everything just looked fantastic. I mean, you know, like it was a, you know, a, a wonderful place to live. But, um, the next slide. And this was a, some kind of a, a, I don't know if it's a Buddhist temple or just what it was, but I thought it was very strange. They were doing some mining and there was a, a river on both sides. So, um, I'm not sure what it was, but I decided to take a photograph of it. Okay, next. After coming back from Quinon, uh, we rode back in the back of a truck, and uh, I had luckily I had my camera with me at this time, and I wasn't sure why, but I did, and um, I started shooting photographs of people planting rice. Okay, the next several shots are going to be of LZ Action, which is a landing zone, and. This is a, uh, a 105 howitzer. It's a, a pulled howitzer. You can pull it behind a, a deuce and a half truck. And next shot, those are some of the shells that, are, that they shoot out of the artillery. These are ready to go because they've got the tops on them. Those are the blasting caps from when it hits, and these are basically so that you can transport them by picking up, they're, they're screwed in, so they actually screw the, the uh, detonators in the tops of them. Next shot. That is one of the artillery's most accurate pieces. It's called an 8-inch gun. And the reason it's different and more accurate is the fact that it has rifling in the barrel, like uh, an actual uh, rifle. Um, it's rifling, so therefore it's, this shell spins as it comes out of it, like it does in a regular rifle. The bullet spins. Well, this is an 8-inch gun, and I mean that thing is huge. When you look down the barrel, it's about that big around. And let's go to the next two slides. That one is called a 175. And as you can see... That might be a nice reach out and slap. <laughs> This is where they kept some of the ammunition. This is right next to where the 
and this was a track vehicle, so therefore it was maneuverable uh, to the extent it didn't have to be pulled by uh, a truck. But this is some of the ammunition that they had ready to go, and of course that's actually firing. And do the next one as well. And you can see the smoke that pours out of the back or out of the barrel, and they're all holding their ears because it'll blow your ears out yeah. if you don't. Okay, um, next slide. When we would go on the dismounted ambushes, um, this is some of the equipment that we took with us besides our M16s, uh, M60, or M60 machine gun, and M79 grenade launcher, which is about a, I think it was a five millimeter shell. Um, anyway, this is a Claymore mine. This was our, this was the detonator for the Claymore mine, and then you had a hundred feet of cable. And so you wanted to make sure that you were far enough away from the back blast of this thing, because otherwise it would blow your ears out as well when that went off. Um, the other thing the Army didn't like us to do, we tore these things apart one time. This is the blasting cap that you had to put down in there in order to... That's a pound and a half of C4, which is a very highly explosive. You may hear some of this in the news about C4. Uh, we actually took one of these apart at times, and uh, we used it to uh, heat our coffee in the morning, our water. Uh, we used their heating pellets, and, you know, it could take two or three minutes to you know to boil your water in your canteen cup. You take a chunk of C4, you know, very highly explosive material, as long as it was detonated with a blasting cap, and you could take a chunk of C4, put it inside your little you know burner type thing, light it, it will burn. You'll have hot boiling hot water in your canteen cup in 30 seconds. <laughs> so that's the reason we we were in a hurry. We use we use C4 to heat our water. <laughs> so this is some of the things we also had different colored flares. Um, you know, of course, our water, everything else that we carried. I even had a uh, a transistor radio with me. I could listen to Radio Saigon in the morning. Um, one morning, uh, it was on one of the armored personnel carriers, around 6 in the morning, talked about temperature. Radio Saigon was on, and I was listening to it, and they gave the temperature. I was sitting there, it's about 5.30, 6 in the morning, and I was sitting there freezing. I had an army blanket wrapped around me, and or was it a poncho liner, I'm not really sure. But anyway, my teeth were chattering at 6 in the morning. Radio Saigon said it was 70 degrees. Because you were used to, and got used to, uh, 100 degrees days, or more, I don't know. I never had a thermometer to tell me how hot it got. So, <clears throat> my first, the other, going back a little bit, First time I got off the airplane in Vietnam in Cameron Bay, you could feel the humidity and you could feel the heat. And it was definitely, and you could tell that you were in a different country because it was a different smell in the air. Did you get that in Louisiana? Pardon me? You didn't get the heat and humidity in Louisiana too? Well, I lived in Florida for 13 years, 11 years. So I know what humidity and heat is. I was still, this was. Maybe a little like this, a little drier heat. Yeah, no, it wasn't maybe as humid. Because remember, we were in them. We weren't on the coast. And we were up. We were in, you know, the Central Highlands. We weren't down in the Delta area. Okay, next slide, because this is going to go a little long. I ran into these three guys from time to time. And the only reason I took their picture was because sometimes we would get hot chow twice a day. Breakfast. Lunchtime was sea rations, and dinner was a hot meal. And they would bring out, when we were sitting on the armor personnel carriers on guard duty, guarding the road, <clears throat> sometimes these kids would come around. And so if I didn't finish my food on my plate, which was a paper plate, 
I would hand them to these kids and they would eat the rest of the food. They didn't care what it was, they would eat. Because I'm sure they did not have the kind of food we did. Did they want the heart? Um, no. no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, one night we were pulling uh, guard duty by a bridge one night that comes to mind. And there was we were close to a village. And uh, we were talking to them a little bit, you know, with the broken language. And uh, I ended up... Uh, we found out that they had Coca-Cola. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And, you know, we were paying, you know, what, a quarter for a can of Coke back here in the States at that time? Or less, I don't remember. Anyway, I had complained the fact that they had Coke, and they wanted a dollar for a can of Coke <laughs> in 1970. So I pulled out my wallet with MPC money in it, and that's military payment certificates. We didn't carry greenback. In, in any country <clears throat> and anyway I would give them a dollar and they would give me a can of coke now, remember they don't have ice machines or anything so it was a warm can of coke not a cold one so but we did have ice we had uh, the way that the military served our hot food we used to armored personnel carriers and the tank guys basically we would steal these at least one for everything and we would get ice from the from the mess hall we would pack that up so we would get our monthly rations of coke or sodas of some sort and beer and so we usually always had ice in our what they called a mermaid can i don't know but how it got its name but anyway <coughs> That's where these kids came in, is the fact that they would get my leftovers, and I don't know if anybody else did, but next picture. This is what happened uh, to you <clears throat> if you didn't take your malaria pills. This guy walked up there to get on that medevac helicopter, had a 105 degree temperature, because he had malaria. That was one thing that the medic came around every single day, and past that, you're, you had one pill was a larger pill, that was a once a week, and then you had the smaller tablets, which is every day. And every day I learned to take that tablet without even drinking anything, with no water, nothing, just putting it in my mouth and swallowing it. And the other thing that surprised me when I got ready to leave Vietnam, they gave us a one month supply of malaria pills to take home, and you were to take them for the 30 days that you were home, so that you still, it didn't get you later on. Next slide. These, these slides here, um, yep, these slides here are the ones, there's this one, go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. This is what happens when you, the tanks and that one armored personnel carrier hit a landmine. That's the damage that can be done. Now this one here is a different one. This one, <clears throat> they were running the chow. This was a second platoon armored personnel carrier that was running the chow uh, out to their particular unit. And when they were coming back in to drop off the, the, uh, the food cans, so they could be cleaned up for the next day. They were going back to their location that night, and they got ambushed. They hit a B-40 rocket, hit them, and believe it or not, there was not one person injured on this at all. They all jumped off, <coughs> but you had 11,000 rounds of ammunition cooking off all night long. Oh, well, this thing caught fire. <clears throat> of course, it's aluminum alloy, so therefore some of it melted. This was the engine compartment. I don't know what they did with this, but as you can see, the, you know, this was now on a flatbed truck and they were hauling it back. I don't know what they were gonna do with it. But I was able to luckily get a picture. I mean, word spread quickly that we had one of our platoons had a, that was attacked going back to their night locations after the child run. So anybody, anytime that I was on that type of a run, we made sure that we were watching extra close. 
and making sure we didn't get hit. But that's what happens. The next slide is also, that was one of our armored personnel carriers that got hit. <clears throat> and this is one of the others. This was one of the different type of armored personnel carriers. There was only one per platoon. And our particular one had a, a 4.2 inch mortar that they could, uh, that fired mortar rounds out of it. And some of the mortar casings or the, the containers are over here that they, because they had to strip. I mean, everything you owned, all your fatigues, anything, your extra pair of boots, whatever you had, you, that was in there. You lived inside these things for an entire time. Okay, next photograph. Also on the convoys, this is the type of truck. They, um, this was called Iron Butterfly Junior. And basically they had M60 machine guns, they had 50 caliber machine guns, and these trucks would run along. They were armor plated on the sides. This was like a regular deuce and a half truck and a two and a half ton truck, but they had armor plating and um, they had sandbags along the floor to protect them in case they you know, hit something or something hit them. But uh, they were well armed and they would run the convoys and periodically spaced out behind different uh, vehicles. All right, next slide. Uh, this is a, uh, a Huey helicopter, only this is a special one. Uh, this had uh, 40 millimeter rocket pods on each side. So I don't know, it was either probably six or eight rockets on each side. And um, we did get to see them once in a while shoot some rockets uh, at the enemy. Okay, next slide. This was a very strange day. This was LZ action right where their artillery base is at. And that, of course, LZ is landing zone. And all of a sudden, a helicopter came in. And that had this particular guy. And in a second, I'll have you to show the other one. And of course, everybody that's been in the military knows what the, the USO is. Okay, so they were looking to boost, boost morale at this particular base. And so, next slide. They bring out these. <laughs> now, I don't want to offend any Zimmer, but we refer to these as round eyes. Because everybody else didn't have round eyes in Vietnam. So, they did, I don't know, a skit or two or whatever, They some kind of little entertainment besides being what you can see there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it boosted morale as you could see as the guys were all hanging around. So that was oh, yeah. that was the height of the day when we saw two females walking out of a helicopter, <laughs> and uh, that was a shock. That was the only time that this has happened. You got the weapons pointed out. And luckily, I had the tank camera at the time. All right, next shot. That's the flight jacket that we were supposed to be wearing when we were on the armor personnel carrier. Remember, 100 plus temperature degrees with this thing. Sounds like you're saying flight. That was to protect you from. Um, that was to protect you from shrapnel or bullets. One particular <laughs> night, I was on guard duty. I'm going to pass this around. Be careful. It is sharp. This is a piece of shrapnel that landed three feet from my location one night. The armor or the uh, the artillery at LZ Action was firing on some sensors. They had sensors back in Vietnam that detected troop movement, and of course they knew where the friendlies were and they knew where the non-friendlies were if the sensors went off. The sensors went off one night. LZ Action artillery got word to fire at that location. There's only one problem. They were a thousand meters off on their calculations. So I got on the radio that night, this was early enough, and I said, I called back to the headquarters the troop, where it was back, our headquarters division, and said, you get those alphas to stop firing because we're receiving secondary shrapnel from your location, at our location. And I found this on the intake 
air intake of the armor personnel carrier three feet from where I sat that night. So be careful. Use strong language. And that thing is not exactly light. How strong a language did you use? <laughs> uh, I don't want to repeat that. Uh, next slide. This was the particular slide that's also in the handout. Um, I thought that was one of the better types to show the type of uh, the, how the dirt gets all uh, powdery. One of the bunkers, basically, and just some of the hillsides of what Vietnam looked like during that time frame. Of course, I've been in country over 90 days because I had my uh, combat infantry badge, which you had to be in country 90 days in order to get that. Okay, next slide. That's I wore that outfit for the entire seven days or six days in Cameron, uh, uh, no, in Japan. Camp Zuma. Uh, when R and R, I looked for the at the time. I took R and R the first part of August, and I'm leaving. You know, 100 degree temperature days, and I really, my goal was to go to Australia. I realized that Australia is in the dead of winter. I said, no, I'm not going to a cold climate after being 100 degree temperatures. So I went to Japan because it was the longest. R and R you could take besides Thailand, and you could also go to Hawaii. A lot of um, the guys that were married ended up going to Hawaii because they could see their spouse there. She could fly, he could fly in, but that was one of the shortest, um, shortest R and Rs that they gave. It was probably only five days or four days, something like that. I don't remember. Forty-eight years is a long way to remember. <laughs> okay, next slide. This is me. We had to leave. Not in. We we arrived in combat fatigues. We left in khakis. Um, and at this particular time, I made the specialist fourth class. By that time, leaving, and um, that's all my paperwork there and everything. My orders to go to Fort Carson, Colorado. I never arrived there. Because once we got back to Fort Lewis, Washington, they said, all you guys that had orders, no, forget those. <laughs> We're going to send you new orders when you're on your 30-day leave. I ended up in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Next slide. This is me leaving. That's the sign that says, do halt. That's the armor or the uh, gold depository in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And <clears throat> 48 years ago. All right. This next slide, not yet, um, this is in memory, go ahead, of Larry. Larry did not make it home like the rest of us. His name is on the Vietnam Wall. Being off a thousand meters, like I said, that when I had that piece of uh, thing that's floating around there, um, our lieutenant, two lieutenant, took him and a bunch of them, five guys. They were on a dismounted ambush, meaning that they were on foot. They didn't walk very far, but they planted them in a, a, a pre-night location. Well, the second, we were in the first platoon. The second platoon was on an, an armored ambush. In other words, they were on two armored personnel carriers and a tank. <clears throat> and our lieutenant was off a thousand meters and putting our five guys out. Larry died from friendly fire from the second platoon firing out. We had out of five guys, only one came out without a scratch. One was killed and the other three were wounded from our own men. So and I've heard that that was, happened a lot. So, he did not come home. Next shot. Question, sir. Yes. I don't see the lieutenant bar. How did you know that he was a lieutenant? Oh, him? no, he wasn't a lieutenant. <coughs> oh, uh, he was just a, a specialist fourth class or a PFC at the time. Okay. Well, he had a previous picture of, of lieutenant. And he yeah. Believe me, we knew. <laughs> oh, 
you knew who the they did wear the black no they did wear the black bars <laughs> yeah. okay they did wear those yeah um, out in the field the officers you knew who they were mm -hmm. they did not want to advertise because they didn't want to be targeted by the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. now I will say that Larry's particular instance is the only man that we lost we had never, we were never fired upon other than those B-40 rockets that I showed you and some of the other um, events that took place. Uh, they never fired bullets at us, put it this way. We had too much firepower for them to, and for what we did. And the odds of them basically, you know, getting away with it, when they hit that one armored personnel carrier with the B-40 rocket, we caught, we chased them on our armored personnel carriers with the 50 caliber machine guns shooting at them. We also called in the Cobra helicopters, which used the minigun that shoots 6,000 rounds a minute. Literally, it can cut a human in half. It can cut a tree in half. When you're shooting 6,000 rounds of bullets a minute, you can cut anything in half. And so we called in those. They were, you know. If, if they got away, they must have hit a hole and went under. We had also found some of those at times in Vietnam, and we took, you know, I don't know, maybe 10 pounds of C4, and we blew the holes completely up. So, yeah. But Larry's name is right there. I carry in my wallet the location on that wall. So, next slide. These are the, I don't know how many of you have been to Washington, D.C. and to the Vietnam Wall. Uh, I lived in Northern Virginia for 10 years, so I would go visit the wall a number of times. And these were the three guys that they did in bronze. And these were, they cleaned them up. After a while, they got kind of dirty, like bronze normally does, standing out in the middle. So I, they cleaned these guys up, and uh, so this is... The bronze statues for the three men. Next slide. Vietnam Wall in Vietnam or in uh, Washington D.C. Just off of the mall. Um, if you're standing at the Washington Monument and you're looking at the Lincoln Memorial, which I've been to umpteen times, photographed it umpteen times, um, the Vietnam Wall is on the right-hand side. As you're looking down towards, it's very close to the Lincoln Memorial on the right hand side, or on the north side. So, I've been there countless times, um, and anyway, next shot is, this is the nurses, uh, well it, it was set up to be nurses, but it's basically the women that were there in Vietnam at the time, and there are I forget how many names of that women that did die that are on the wall. They're part of the 58,000 um, people that uh, women that, that they did count them. Uh, the nurses basically were all back. Usually they were mostly nurses or some kind of medical assistance mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but this was for them. So anyway, that concludes. Any other questions? So when y'all were guarding the bridges, how many men were, were stationed at the time? We could have in some cases, there was usually four at the minimum, four on an armored personnel carrier, but there was usually sometimes five or six, depending on the, the, the men we had and how they distributed them. Um, but there could be at least one tank and, an armor, and two armored personnel carriers on some bridges, depending on the, the, the level of the importance of that bridge. As you saw, that one bridge that the road was going around, you know, we guarded that. We didn't guard that much at night, I don't believe. But, you know, each bridge, the night that I told you that, that we were receiving secondary shrapnel, that's where we were. We were, we were on a bridge. And, mm -hmm. You know, there was at least two armored personnel carriers. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Was, mm -hmm. Yeah? Back about halfway through, you had an APC or a tank that had said something about woman. Uh, gypsy woman, gypsy woman. Gypsy woman. Um, those were all. They were all designated before I even got there. 
Um, so um, I can't tell you, you know, who put those on there, or what names. Um, they were different. People had put, you know, stuff on. I basically put, uh, uh, you know, Ohio on the front of the uh, shield for my M60 machine gun, and maybe something else, you know, whatever. So like nose art. Yeah, you can put anything you want. I mean, you got a can of paint and the paintbrush, you could. Okay. The military didn't care what we put on it. Well, I don't know if they, you know, surf things. Yeah. Uh, your story reminded me of my, uh, when I was growing up in Pebble, Colorado, my next door neighbor, she had a grandson who was guarding a bridge in Vietnam. And he, they, uh, he took a mortar round in the head. And he lived, but he's crippled up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, did. go ahead. On that Agent Orange, did, were you told to move away from the area when they're going to spray? Or no. did you stay there and they no, spray? No, we were. I can only remember one incident that they were still spraying Agent Orange in, uh, say, the early part of 1970. Uh, I could see the helicopters came by and they had these little things, you know, stuck out on the sides. Um, so um, I knew what they were spraying, or I didn't know what they were spraying because I was still, you know, within three months of in the country. And of course, when we were on the other side of Plate Coup, they didn't have it. They didn't use it over there. Um, and I said, to him, what on earth are they doing? And somebody says, well, they're spraying to kill the foliage. You know, they didn't use the word Agent Orange at the time, but they, they said that they were, you know, it was to kill the, to kill the jungle. I also don't think we were aware of how dangerous it was. Nobody knew yeah. that. Yeah. No, no. <clears throat> and, and neither would, as afterwards we all know, the VA refused to even tell us, even after we started to question it back in the 80s and 90s. So it was just, you know, we didn't know what it was. Yes? But the, uh, the people who lived in the area <clears throat> would be out in that. The kids might be playing and the, the natives would be right out. I'm not sure because through. when the, the only time I remember that it was sprayed, it was sprayed far enough away from us, but, you know, I could see the mist coming down. But it was only one time, and I wasn't, they didn't say, you know, get away from it or anything. They just, you know, of course, they didn't know back in then. No, I, I mean, after it was, was dead, the natives were still out in it, walking through the kids' way. Oh, yeah. I would yeah. assume so. Yeah. Nobody knew anything different. Yeah. I mean, you know, we didn't know until, you know, probably 1980 that it was Agent Orange, and it was, you know, a cancerous thing. So, yeah, I mean, it was just one of those things. That, but I do remember one time, and I didn't know what it was, and then they told me it was, you know, something to kill the, you know, the vegetation. So I said, okay. And they, we didn't see much of it around after that. So, you know, of course, at that time, Nixon was in charge. And after watching... I wasn't going to mention too much of this, but the, um, I went, been watching the uh, Burns in, um, in Novak PBS series on Vietnam. Um, I, I watched the first five. I've got five more to go. Um, sometimes it's a little tough for me to watch, um, especially knowing that the White House was running the war. And it was just pitiful. Did it seem accurate to you so far by watching what you have? Yes and no. Um, because the, the, I'm only up to around January of 67. And I did not know how bad it really was for a tremendous amount of people. And I don't know, that this is the strangest thing, and why basically, after I got back, and I was back in civilian life. Um, what got me was is the fact that I had started here in the 73 time frame, 72, 73, and maybe early 74 before they bailed out, that there was, the guys basically were refusing. They'd say, you know, we want that hill taken, and they'd say, well, hell no, I'm not doing it. And they were starting to refuse orders. And they also, I knew of another guy that I knew, I worked with him, 
Um, and he feared, he was a, uh, a warrant officer in the Army, and uh, he feared for his life when he was over there in 72 or 3, I think, because he was in radio communications and repairs. And basically, you told your men to do something, and the next thing you know, you were fragged that night. So, yeah, it became serious is that the men were turning on, on, their, uh, on the leadership. So, um, the one thing that I last watched on episode five was that they were to take Hill 875. They had three, three companies. The first two went up the hill and one stayed back. 875, they had 107 dead and over 200 wounded out of three companies. And after they got the hill taken and the Viet Cong left, they brought in Chinook helicopters and hauled them all out. The hill didn't mean a damn thing. And so to me, after seeing this, I had no idea that this was all going on. This was in the 66, 67 time frame. This, you know, had rocked shit. Did you see anything? Not in the good way. State. So, yeah. but, uh, you know. Just wait there. Any other questions? Jack? Yes? Just, uh, you, you, you talked about sitting on your, hel on your helmet in the Huey. I have a friend who was a Huey pilot. And uh, I went into his den one day, and he's got a, he's got a piece of porcelain that's five, five or six inches thick, made by Cordes Porcelain. And that's what the pilot set on. And in his is a 50 caliber uh, bullet that was stopped that came when he was when he was flying. It came right up through the bottom of the helicopter. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's the reason they were so concerned about that. Yeah, there was a lot of other um, I mean, I could talk to you all day. I mean, I have so much that I spent my time with over there. Um, actually got to, we were told to go up a hill because it was a 51 caliber machine gun that basically the enemy had up there. We got part way up and it started to get too dark, so we, they turned around and brought us back down. But what I did get to see, we had binoculars with us and the armored personnel carrier was on. We got to see some F-4s dropping napalm, and I'm telling you, that is some wicked stuff. Because you could actually, I could watch the bombs come off of the F-4s as they dropped it and when they hit the ground. Exploded in fire. There's an napalm. Just, it was like a, a gasoline jelly material and it would hit you and stick to you and it would burn you to death. Yeah. So, any other questions? How frequent when y'all were when you were describing walking down the road and you would have like a tank or the armored personnel going kind of before y'all to set off any mines? How frequent would, would that you know, happen? We were ahead of them. Oh, y'all were ahead of them. We were ahead of them That's because the fact, and we were having our M16s. I mean, you know, they talk about the AR-15 today. I mean, ours was completely fully automatic. I mean. The thing about the M16 is, is that if you held the trigger down with a 20 round magazine, 20 round clip, fully loaded, you could pull the trigger. And the first bullet was hitting the ground because the 20th was coming out of the chamber. That's how fast they can shoot it on full automatic. So you can just imagine. I mean, you, you didn't want to shoot that way because the fact that you were wasting ammo and sometimes you know people would just hold them up and they just empty their end magazine drop it out throw another one in and of course in the type of unit we were in we didn't get the 30 round mags at the time we only had 20s and because they sat inside the armor personnel carrier for long periods of time and we had the bandoliers that had uh, around seven or ten mags in each one of those we only put 18 rounds in each one of the magazines because we didn't want to compress the spring, or the spring down. So there was things that you learned the longer you were in country and the longer you were in combat. I mean, literally, we lived and breathed on these things day in and day out. And, I mean, there's other things I could tell you what happened at the LZs during the day. You know, I mean, there's just life. Some people think life is bad here, 
I physically bitch because you are constantly don't know when the enemy is going to attack you or not. And in our case, because we had so much firepower, we were extremely lucky where we were at. Especially when we drove through the Mangang Pass. I had a helicopter, I knew a helicopter pilot. In fact, he's still here, he's down in Oklahoma now. He says, you went through Mangang Pass? Because he used to fly over. <laughs> And I said, yeah, we've been through that many times. He says, I wouldn't go through that place at all. Because there was a lot of horror stories. It was basically, you know, one of the worst zones to go through because you could get ambushed very quickly. And you had to then aim up. And sometimes we would have, our M60 machine guns and even our 50 calibers would not be able to raise up. We would have to take and dismantle them out by just taking and releasing them from their clips, <clears throat> literally to hold them up. And, you know, it, it, you know. John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> How many have ever shot an M60 machine gun? Okay. Hip firing was one thing. <laughs> I literally, in basic or in advanced training, I literally had to shoulder fire that thing. Oh, <laughs> shoulder fire on an M60 machine gun. So, and little, I was only about 135 pounds in the army. So, literally, I mean, I literally had to brace myself because, I mean, that thing shooting, you know, if you held the trigger back, it would shoot 600 rounds in a minute. Did Did it ever knock you on your butt? No. <clears throat> No, I wouldn't let that. I mean, you'd let go of the trigger before that. The other thing that we had to do when we went on the LZs, when we went through the main gate of the of the landing zones, we had to unload our our M16s did not have a round in the chamber when they hung inside. We had to unload the M60 machine guns and the 50 calibers. We learned then once we got on the base, then we learned to half load. I don't know if you've ever. M60 machine gun. You ever half load an M60 no, machine not gun? Half load, no. <laughs> we had to half load it because we learned that because when you the bolt had to be in the back position in order to close yeah. the hatch. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. But if you let the bolt go forward with the with the belt up there with mag, the ammo in it, it would fire off the round and the bolt would then launch back and you know if you held the trigger back. Of course, it was a fully automatic weapon. What we ended up doing was, is we would put the layer of, of ammo up just where it would catch the one notch. With the bolt in the back, we would close the, the cover, and then we would take and pull the trigger and then let the bolt go forward. And then when we would pull it back, then it loaded the weapon. So we were able to half load when we were inside the base then and in our position. They didn't want us going fully loaded into a, into an LZ because there was there could be I don't know 100 or 200 people in an LZ at night yeah. for all the artillery. So yeah. So anyway, any others? Any other questions? Yes. No, I just have a comment. Um, I mistook you a minute ago when I raised my hand. I thought you said something else. I never uh, worked or been around the M60s. My twin brother was in Vietnam with the 9th Infantry Division, and he with, was with my, my twin brother was with the 9th Infantry Division. Yeah, and he was the gunner. Okay, and his job was when he was in Vietnam was with the M60. Yeah, so the helicopter always, gunners basically had the, the shorter lifespan. Yes, um, because they were targeted. To which the, the gunners on the helicopters. Well, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was infantry. Oh, it was infantry. Okay, yeah. Okay. But they looked for those guys. Well, from what I understand, watching the the, the videos from uh, PBS, the M6, the M, the, the machine gunners basically were always targeted. And they did also that, I think, in the World War II era. Yeah. Well, so. unfortunately, he, in, uh, in in the Mekong Delta, he he, he didn't make it home. Okay. He's on display in the in the Vietnam section He's, over here. Oh, he didn't get buried in Arlington then. No, no, he's buried here at uh, Fort Logan. But there is a series on on the uh, uh, Netflix. <clears throat> it's called Brothers at, Brothers at War. Yeah. That's about my brother. 
No kind. So if anybody ever comes on yeah. Netflix and brings up uh, Brothers, uh, closest, Brothers of War, he's, the, that's about him. Closest Hollywood movie that I've seen that represents Vietnam would be the movie Platoon. Right, but this is documentary, it's not a movie. Okay, yeah, okay. It's actual footage and, and so forth, up to the day that he died. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? I had a co cousin who was a chief on the helicopter. He died from Agent Orange. And he says um, they used to walk around the Delta. They'd be flying through that stuff all the time. All the time. I heard that the people that, that loaded it onto the helicopters, and um, I'm not sure if any C-1... 30s were prepared for that as well, but in my neighborhood there's uh, a guy behind me who's a uh, first lieutenant, and he was a guy that was being the convoys uh, in the jeep because he was the uh, the officer basically that was uh, in charge of the convoy.